Welcome to Algebra 2. Today we've got the Chapter 9b review. This is where we are graphing all of our trig functions. So let's get right to it. Your test will open up with five graphing trig functions problems. They could be any of our six trig functions that we've seen uh, throughout Chapter 9. And you'll also be asked to provide the amplitude period, increments, phase shift, center line. And really, we should be finding those anyway because they're going to help us construct our graph. So I start off here on problem one with a negative five sine of one half x. The amplitude of that is five. It's vertically stretched five times as tall. And I know that amplitude cannot be negative because it's a distance measurement. The period of the graph, because it is a sine function, it starts off having a period of two pi. But I notice that it is going half as fast. So I need to divide away one half the speed adjustment that that function's undergoing. And I get a period of four pi. The increments then are the period divided by four to represent the four quadrants um, as we go through a circle of radian rotation. And I get increments of pi. That's going to help me label my uh, x-axis. The phase shift, well, there's no quantity where x is adding or subtracting a value to it. So they're starting at x equals zero for our phase shift. And the center line, they are not adding or subtracting anything to the function outside of the function that would raise or lower that function. So it's just y equals zero. So let's get our axes labeled. Each of these problems will be worth eight points, five for filling in the blanks appropriately on the left and three for the graph. One of the things I'm looking for is do you have your labels correct? So here you can see that our four increments being labeled Okay, that's looking at the labels on the X. On the Y, I need to go up to a height of 5, down to negative 5 to show that amplitude in the negative downward direction. So there are the labels. That's one point for the graph, and we haven't even drawn anything yet. To actually draw the function in, we need to know some basics about the parent function for sine. And we had said in class, kind of a nice way of putting it, a sine curve over one period will make an S shape. So um, we're looking for an S-shaped graph though it may be stretched and flipped and shifted around. All right, I know that sine starts on the center line at its phase shift value. So when I start this graph at x equals 0, I start on the center line. And it is a negative sign. So instead of rising like your typical parent function would, this one's vertically flipped. It goes down to negative 5, back to its center line, up to positive 5, back to its center line to create that S shape. All right, and that's all we have to do for problem one. These go pretty quickly. Next, we have a cosine function. Let's go through and find those, um, fill in our list over here to the left. The amplitude, that cosine function is four-fifths as tall. Its period is two pi because we are not adjusting the speed, not multiplying x by anything. The increments are then two pi divided by four, which is pi over two. Our phase shift, here you can see they have subtracted from our x value. So the solution, if I were to solve that set of parentheses for x, it would be x equals positive pi over 2, or a shift to the right pi over 2 units. And our center line, they have not added or subtracted anything outside the function, so the center line remains y equals 0. Okay, so now my first tick mark where I begin that graph is going to be at pi over 2, and from there I'll mark out my four increments. And it's okay if you leave these unsimplified. Sometimes that's nicer to see the pattern. I want to go until I have one, two, three, four spaces in between those tick marks. That'll be one full period. For the y-axis, I'm going up to a height of four-fifths, down to negative four-fifths. And again, that's because my center line is y equals zero. I didn't have to adjust those at all. Okay, a typical cosine function, if we were to imagine just the parent function, it starts off at a maximum and makes a C shape, C for cosine, just like we had S for sine. So my first point starts at the phase shift value, pi over 2. It starts up at its maximum, then goes to the center line, then to its minimum, back to the center line, and back to a maximum. And we know it's going to follow the same shape as the parent because it has not been vertically flipped. Right, so here we draw our graph in. Good. 
good. Make sure that when you draw these graphs, I will take points off. Um, it may seem like a picky thing, but if your graph looks like this, these are not sharp graphs at all. So don't do that. You will lose points on the exam. Make sure they're nice, smooth, um, gradually changing graphs. They bend. Next, we got a tangent, and you'll see amplitude is in quotes. Technically, tangent functions do not have an amplitude because they do not have a maximum or a minimum output. The amplitude, though, in quotes, is just our vertical stretch. So here, this tangent function is half as tall as a typical parent function would be. Period for tangent starts off at pi radians, and we discussed that in section 9.5, and it's going twice as fast. So the period is pi over 2. And my increments, again, I'm taking that period value pi over 2 and dividing by 4. Now, some people have struggled with this in class. So I just want you to think, hey, if I'm taking a fraction and dividing it by another number, well, what if that other number were a fraction? We know how to do that, right? Top number times the reciprocal of the bottom number and multiply across the top and bottom. I've got pi over 8. And there's a nice little pattern there. If we're dividing by 4, taking a fraction and dividing it by 4, we're really just multiplying 4 into the denominator. And that's happening over and over and over again. So hopefully we've picked up on that. For the phase shift value, they have not added or subtracted anything to x. So x equals 0. It's not being shifted left or right. Center line, they have not added or subtracted anything to the entire function. So our center line has not been lifted up or down. y equals 0. If I'm starting at x equals 0, let's mark out our four increments. Four. Each one of those is a pi over 8. And I know that my amplitude, quote unquote amplitude, is going up to 1 half, down to negative 1 half. And as we've learned in section 9.5, with a tangent function, its parent will start off at 0, then go through some positive point and approach a vertical asymptote. Then it will have some negative point and go back to 0 to complete one period of tangent. So our graph should look something like that. OK, so let's mimic that in this situation. Tangent starts off at 0, so my phase shift value x equals 0, the height is 0. The next increment, tangent becomes positive, and at the next increment, it's drawing close to that vertical asymptote. Then it's at its negative value for the next increment, and then finally getting back to zero at the end. There is our graph of one period of tangent. Number four, here we've got a secant function, so a reciprocal function. We need to know what is that based off of. So secant is the reciprocal of cosine. Excuse me, so I'm going to make a cosine stencil graph, we called it, and then um, plot in some vertical asymptotes and adjust that cosine graph to be secant instead. So for filling in our blanks, we're going to treat it as if it were a cosine. The amplitude of that cosine graph is just one half. Its period is 2 pi divided by 4, and I'm starting off with 2 pi because, again, I'm treating it like a cosine function. Period's pi over 2. Hey, there's that case again where I've got a fraction and I'm dividing it by 4. All it's going to do is multiply that 4 into the denominator, makes it smaller. Phase shift, they have not added or subtracted anything to x. Center line, they have not added or subtracted anything to the entire function. So it's x equals 0 and y equals 0, respectively, for those. So you can see it's pretty easy to get five out of eight points on every single graph just by, you know, ripping right through those little blanks. Okay, on the graph itself, let's get some tick marks drawn in. Start off at x equals zero, then pi over eights. Measure out my x-axis. Make sure I go four increments away. And I know that my amplitude is going up to positive one-half, down to negative one-half. Let's draw in that cosine that's a stencil. Cosine starts, it's a positive secant graph. I'm treating it like a positive cosine. Starts at a maximum, center line, minimum, center line, back to maximum. Now, this isn't my graph, so I'm just going to make a dashed version of that cosine graph. Again, just a stencil. It's going to help me draw the secant graph. Now, the actual secant graph 
has vertical asymptotes in it. Any time that my cosine zeroed out, so here at pi over 8 and 3 pi over 8, when I take the reciprocal, I get 1 over 0. So that's where the vertical asymptotes come into play for my secant graph. So I'll draw those in. And then I simply take the maxes and mins from that cosine stencil and flip them in a way that they approach their asymptotes. So you can see the secant graph doesn't really have an amplitude, but the cosine sure did when we were setting up our stencil. There's our graph of one period of the secant function. And our final graphing problem will be the most challenging. Um, it, it just has the most adjustments involved. So be prepared for problem number five to be a little bit trickier to graph. Now, one thing that students will be tempted to do is to just take this 3 minus 3 and call that 0 right away. Do not do that. We've talked about this in class. It's tempting. But really, this 3 is the same thing as if they had written plus 3 at the end. Right? The, this other, this negative 3 right here is all attached to that, co uh, that sine function. So we got to leave that one alone. Okay? We should be able to rattle through all of the qualities over here pretty easily, though. The amplitude is 3, right? It's a 3 times sine. The period of that graph, it is going half as fast. So I'm doing 2 pi, it's a sine function, divided by 1 half, that's 4 pi. My increments, the period divided by 4, just counting by pi's. The phase shift, well, here this is being added onto x. That's a shift to the left pi unit, so x equals negative pi is my phase shift value. And my center line, that loose 3 that we had out front that really could be called plus 3 at the very end, that's lifting the graph up 3 units. So y equals 3 is that center line. Let's go to the graph. On the x-axis, here I've got that negative pi. I need that there because that's my phase shift value. That's where I'm going to start. And then one increment will lead me to 0. The next to pi, the third to 2 pi, and the final increment to 3 pi. And then along my y-axis, my center line is y equals 3. So I'm just going to sketch in that center line up here. That's what the graph is going to oscillate around. And I also need to account for the amplitude to go 3 units up above that, get up to 6. And you don't have to label every single tick mark, but um, it's nice if it's spaced out appropriately. If you were to graph this, uh, well, I'll talk about that at the end. Okay, now we've got a negative sine function, right? It's negative 3 sine of x. So I know that sine starts, so I'm starting here at negative pi on the x-axis. It starts on its center line there. And normally a sine would go up, but this one's being vertically flipped. So it goes down to a minimum, then back to the center line, then up to a maximum, then back to the center line. Here is our graph of one period of this sine function. Now, to go back to what I said earlier about um, what I might take points off for or what I will take points off for, um, you don't have to label every single tick mark along the y-axis. Um, but here, especially, it's helpful to do that because if you go through and hastily draw this graph, right, let's say maybe you get everything else right. It starts up, but then you have it like going below the axis or something like that. That graph never goes below the x-axis, or it should not. So if you had something like that, I would take points off because you have not properly followed what the amplitude is doing when you measure it from the center line. So be careful that even though it may not have to be perfectly spaced out or anything like that, I'm having you label these, uh, these axes yourself. Make sure the graph's obeying what it should be obeying. All right, so we made it through those graphing problems. And you can see it's only taken us 15 minutes to do that. Um, this test does go pretty quickly. Um, the next section here, we have to construct a function. So for number uh, six here, we're starting with a cosine function. And we see our old friend, the followed by transformations happening. Well, if I start off with f of x equaling cosine x, the first thing I need to do is a vertical reflection. 
So I'm going to call this, we called it a stepping stone, I think, when we did it uh, first semester. That h of x, to do a vertical reflection, I simply negate f of x. I put a negative sign out front. So after doing the vertical reflection, I have negative cosine of x. All right. Then the followed by part. Here's where I get my answer. g of x, if I want to go pi over 3 units to the right, it means I'm going to take that function h that I just built, and instead of just x as an input, I need to subtract pi over 3 from that. And then the 7 units up would be a plus 7. I'm sorry, my smart board has been acting up quite a bit lately. Plus 7 afterwards. So if I make those adjustments into the, uh, the function h that I constructed, I have my negative sign out front, then I have cosine inside. It's going to be that x minus pi over 3 adjustment that I just made, and then we'll also have plus 7 at the end. There's our final answer for number 6. Boy, that's a mess. I'm, I'm sorry for the smart board glitching out a little bit. Let's move down to number 7. Here we've got a cosecant function as a parent. First, we have a vertical shrink by a factor of two-thirds. Okay, so let's set up our stepping stone there. To do a vertical shrink, I'm taking two-thirds and multiplying that out front of the function f. That would give me two-thirds cosecant x. Then, secondly, I need to do a horizontal stretch. Hmm, horizontal stretch. Well, my horizontal axis usually measures like time. So if I'm stretching that out, it means my function must be moving slower. So this is really saying half as fast. And that's what would have to happen if it were going slower, if it were taking twice as much time. So I want to take my h of x and make it go half as fast. So my input will be one half x. Okay, so final answer should be two thirds cosecant of one half x. Okay, and for our final problem, uh, temperature in the Mojave Desert over a three day period can be modeled by the function given there. It's a, some sine function. Where T of X is measured in degrees Fahrenheit, so the output is degrees Fahrenheit, and X, the input, is hours past midnight on the first day. What is the temperature at 6.30 p.m. on the first day? All right, well, all we're doing is taking this time that we know and plugging it into the function because times our inputs here, our hours past midnight, are the inputs. All we're going to do is plug it into the function. So I'm really trying to find T of, well, how would I say 6.30 p.m.? Let's see, hours past midnight. Um, so let's see, 6.30 p.m. to go from midnight to noon, that's 12 hours. And then to 6 o'clock p.m. would be 18 hours. I would add on six more. And then 30 would be an extra half hour. So I want T of 18.5. So into the calculator, and there's a note there, make sure it's in radian mode. Otherwise, you will not get this, this question correct at all. <clears throat> Into the calculator goes 24.075 times the sine of 0.245 times 18.5, our time input, minus 2.05, close up the sine, and then plus 66.77. And if our calculator is in radian mode, if we've got all that stuff squared away and we've done that correctly, we should get an answer of 81.51 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, label's important there. Obviously, we're talking about a real world situation, so we want to be sure that we are answering uh, in the appropriate units. And that's really it, right? This is half of a chapter, so the test isn't really incredibly substantial. We just wanted to separate this graphing uh, concept and, and the idea of using trig functions as waves, do that separately uh, from all the right triangle trig and unit circle work that we did uh, in the first part of the chapter. So I hope you found this review helpful and good luck on the test tomorrow.